Hi, this is Oren. If you find these teachings useful and you'd like to learn more about my work, you can visit me online at orenjsofer.com or on social media at orenjsofer. Thanks so much. So first, I just want to want to check the sound and see. Can you hear me okay in the back? It's not too loud. No feedback. Okay, great. Ah, well, good evening. Yeah, thanks so much for coming out on a on a cold winter Friday night. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be back here and uh, see some familiar faces and, uh, and also many new faces. Uh, so I'm just, just curious, um, how many people uh, come to New York Insight regularly, like this is your spot, you know, you're here? Awesome, great. And how many folks, uh, let's do the other side, how many folks are here for the first time tonight? Woohoo! awesome, great, well welcome. Yeah, that's really sweet. Um, how many people, uh, Sit meditation retreats. You, you're kind of a meditation walla. Okay, great. And uh, how many people are sort of newer to meditation? You're kind of just getting started, feeling things out. Wonderful. Great. So we got a really nice mix in the room. Cool. So um, we'll do some meditation together for about 35 or 40 minutes. I'll offer a few instructions, some light guidance, and then we'll sit in silence together. Uh, for a while. Then we'll take a short break, just stretch your legs, um, get a drink, check out the books and so forth. And then we'll come back together uh, for the second half. Uh, I'll offer some, uh, some thoughts and reflections. And then we'll end with a little bit of discussion, some Q&A. And uh, for those who'd like. So I thought I would start this evening uh, by just reading uh, a few paragraphs from the introduction of my book, uh, just to kind of frame things a little bit for, um, for our evening. What we say matters. We've each felt the power that words have to heal, soothe, or uplift us. Even one caring remark can make the difference between giving up and finding the strength to face life's challenges. We each also know something of the great harm that can be inflicted through speech. Sharp words laced with anger or cruelty can break a relationship, can burn for years. Language can be used to manipulate and coerce on a mass scale to fuel fear war, oppression, or to advance political agendas of genocide or terror. Few things so powerful are also so commonplace. Words are woven into the fabric of our lives. Your first love, your first job, your last goodbye to someone you love, our beginnings and endings and the countless moments in between are punctuated by a play of words as we share our thoughts, feelings, and desires. Words are a kind of magic. To be alive and self-aware on this remarkable planet with its forests and lakes, its oceans and mountains in this vast universe with billions of galaxies is mysterious enough. What a marvel to be able to look into each other's eyes for an instant and form words that tell something of our lives. What we say matters, perhaps now more than ever. We live in times of great change in which much is being asked of us. 
we live at a time when we are less and less able to listen and really hear one another in society. At a time when those with different views, beliefs, or backgrounds are, once again, so easily cast as the other. At this time when great forces of political, social, economic, and environmental change are sweeping the globe and intensifying our separation from self, others, and life, we need to learn how to speak and listen in a new way. We need to learn how to reperceive our world with fresh eyes beyond inherited historical and economic structures of competition and separation that can so easily determine our relationships. It's heartbreaking to know the good of which we are capable, yet to see so much destruction and violence. In Japan, there's a saying, the cherry blossoms are beautiful because they are fleeting. We each have an opportunity to use the time and energy we are given with integrity. My hope is that this book might in some small way help us begin to realize our potential for good as humans by learning to bring more compassion, wisdom, and kindness to how we navigate the relationships that make up our everyday lives. I hope it might help us to transform the mechanisms of thought and perception that make violence seem like a viable strategy, that it can be one step in creating a world that works for all. So uh, big challenges for the human species today. From, uh, from everything that's happening in our environments to kind of this, you know, what's, what's happening in our country and in our government right now is, is sort of this like representation of the dysfunction in our society, of our inability to actually listen and dialogue with one another, right? To the point that the actual, the wheels of governance have, have grinded to a halt. So the question that I've been, um, the word that always comes to mind when I start that sentence is obsessed. <laughs> The question, but it's, but it's not. It hasn't been an obsession. It's been more like a passion. You know, the question that I've been passionate about for the last 20 years of my life is how. How do we bring our deep, deeper values into our life? How do we translate what happens here on the cushion, here at New York Insight, you know, in your home, uh, in, on retreats, when we do contemplative practice, how do we translate that into the workplace, into our marriage, into our friendships, into politics, into the very real nitty gritty of our life? I think that the Buddha understood the importance of speech in our spiritual development and also in the functioning of a healthy society. In one of the key templates that the Buddha offers as a, a whole kind of summary of the spiritual path, which is referred to as the Noble Eightfold Path, many of you are familiar with it, um, he singles out speech, communication, as one of eight factors for us to cultivate that lead to awakening and freedom. That always stood out to me as having some real significance. He chose to place all of the other ethical considerations of life, our livelihood, our actions, our sexuality, how we relate to intoxicants, all of that he chose to lump together in 
action, right action, how we, how we behave and how we engage. But for some reason, speech was important enough that he said, no, this is, this is separate. This is its own training. And if you look at the structure of the Noble Eightfold Path, the training in right speech comes before meditation. It comes very close to the beginning, right after the two trainings in wisdom, right after right view and right intention. The very next thing is right speech. Saying, pay attention to the words that you choose in your life, to the ways that we think, to the ways that we listen. And there's a very good reason for this. If we start to observe the role that language plays in our life, very quickly we realize how central it is to so much that we do. And in particular, to our sense of well-being, to the quality of our relationships, and to a large degree to our sense of worldly success professionally, all of that depends on our communication because our communication determines our relationships. So just consider for a moment how important are your relationships in life? I mean, think about what brings you the most joy, the times that you've been happiest in your life. How much of those have involved other people? And then look at the flip side, right? Think about the places that we really feel pain, the places that really break our heart. Other people, right? And so, so this is one reason why right speech is so important is because it's shaping our relationships. Our relationships are a series of interactions and those interactions to a large degree are made up of communication. But there's another reason why right speech is so important in our lives and on the contemplative path. And this has to do with how we think and the role that language plays in the way that we relate to the world and to ourselves. So the ways that we think color how we perceive things and the way that we perceive things then determines how we relate to them. So our thoughts, our language, our concepts structure our reality. So if we want to learn how to live a more meaningful life, if we want to learn how to come from our values, regardless of the circumstances or the behavior of others, starting to pay attention, not only to our speech, but to our thoughts, to the ways that we listen, is an incredibly useful training. So if you're not convinced <laughs> yet, I'll give you one more, one more reason. We're doing it all day long. So unless you live in a cave on a mountain, and if you're in this room, you don't, <laughs> you're probably communicating all day. We're doing it at home. We're doing it at work. We're doing it with friends when we go out. We're emailing, we're texting, we're on social media, we're reading the news. Even when we're alone, we're thinking, right? We're planning, we're telling a story, there's that narrative that's going. So if we're interested in transformation, whether it's personal transformation, interpersonal transformation, or collective transformation, our communication is one of the most prevalent and accessible leverage points that we have. So if you make one change, just one, small change in your communication, but you carry it through, you stick with it, that will affect everything in your life. It will affect all of your relationships, all of your conversations. It will affect your relationship with yourself. This is the power of right speech, of taking on this training in communication. 
So a lot of the, one of the questions that comes up a lot as, as a meditation teacher, you know, people ask, I don't have time to sit. I'm too busy. I don't have time to, you know, practice meditation for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, once a day, twice a day. Well, if you take on right speech as part of your contemplative practice, guess what? You've got hours and hours of contemplative practice all day long happening, right? So going back to the question of how, right? How do we do this? Particularly today, and one of the, the title for our, our evening today is Right Speech in a Post-Truth World, right? How do we actually have a conversation and a dialogue when we can't even agree on the data? Right? When, we, when we don't have a shared observation of what we're talking about, or when the intensity of the polarization. I had one, uh, one gentleman email me recently uh, out in California who's a conservative, and he says, you know, I want to come to one of your events, but I, I wanted to check with you. Am I welcome? This Dharma community, I notice, is very, tends to be very left politically. And often when I come to these events or when I talk to people and try to express my views, you know, uh, people get very angry at me and they won't listen. Am I welcome in your community? It's a very, very good question. And I said, absolutely, please come. I'm so glad you emailed me. I want you there. This is very important. So when the intensity of the polarization means that even expressing a different view, right? Whatever side of the political spectrum you're on r r um, calls forth this, this vehement reaction. So how can we have a conversation? And how are we ever going to face the challenges? You know, how many of you have children in this room? Right? I mean, many of us are going to see, are all, we're already seeing drastic changes on the planet in, in our lifetime, let alone what's to come for the next generation. If we can't have a conversation with someone who sees things differently from us. So the, the, the structure of my book is, um, my book is structured around three core trainings. And I want to share with you tonight what these three core trainings are and, uh, and give you a tool or a practice for each of them so that you can, whether you decide to read my book or not, so that you can start to explore and experiment with this in your own life uh, and see if you can get some traction for starting to have more meaningful conversations, for starting to really be able to listen and hear one another even when we disagree, right? Because that's where the test is. It's fine to have a conversation with someone I agree with, right? It's when we disagree, can I stay engaged? Can I build some mutual respect? Even if we don't see eye to eye. So the guidelines for right speech that the Buddha offers are, uh, are pretty clear. Uh, there are many different um, kind of configurations in the early texts for how they show up. Um, the, most, uh, the most common and the classical one is in the negative. It's what not to do. Because it's a lot easier to say what not to do sometimes than to say what to do. So if you just pay attention, just don't do this and <laughs> what to do will slowly become clear. Okay, that was, that was the Buddha's kind of MO a lot of the time. It was just, okay, just try to stop doing that and things will sort of start to come together. So he said to pay attention to four kinds of speech and avoid them. So the first is false speech. Don't say things that aren't true. <laughs> right? It's pretty basic. But we can really investigate and start to go a little bit more deeper than just lying, right? Outright lying, right? Bending the truth a little bit, you know, exaggerating and really looking at what's my motivation when I do that? Why? What's inspiring me to do that? 
And what would it be like to really have a firm and, and solid commitment to being as truthful and honest as possible, right? So somebody asked a question last night at an event that I was, uh, I was at another event, I said, you know, how do I deal with a coworker who's being rude? Well, if you're practicing right speech and you have the thought you're being rude, you recognize, you know, it's not actually true. Why? Well, what's rude to me might not be rude to you. That's subjective. So how do I be truly honest? Well, what's really happening is that I'm not enjoying the way you're speaking to me. Which is more true? You're being rude or I'm not enjoying the way you're speaking to me? See the difference? So this is some of the refinements that we can get into with right speech really examining our perceptions and starting to take these very simple trainings to a deeper level. So the first is don't say things that aren't true. Abstain from false speech. The second is how we say it. Try not to say things that are harsh. You know, none of us like being spoken to with sharp words, a cutting tone, with bitterness. It doesn't feel good. It's not helpful. Try to avoid harsh speech. If you need to say something that's difficult for someone to hear, find the right time and place to say it and try to say it in a way that's going to be helpful. So false speech, harsh speech. The next one we have a lot to learn from today. <laughs> Divisive speech. Speech that separates people from one another. That pits them against each other. Try not to, try not to use divisive speech. And the last, which is often in some ways the hardest, is abstain from useless speech. <laughs> speech that just has no purpose whatsoever. And that, to me, that doesn't mean chit-chat. Chit-chat serves a purpose, right? We're, we're, we're hanging out. We're, it's called social engagement. It's actually very healthy for our nervous system, right? It's like uh, other primates do it by picking bugs out of their skin. <laughs> We do it by saying, how's it going? All right, you see the game last night? Yeah, it was amazing, right? We're just, we're just kind of feeling warmth and connecting. That's not what's meant by idle speech or useless speech. We, you know when someone's just going on and on and it's just, it's exhausting, right? It drains us, wasting our energy, wasting our words. So this is one of the frameworks, one of the templates that the Buddha puts forward paying attention to what we say, when we say it, how we say it, why we say it. But then to actually practice with this is a training. And this is where these, these three foundations of training come in from my book. So if we want to start to be able to listen to one another when we disagree, to try to have a more meaningful, productive conversation, the first and most fundamental prerequisite is being mindful. It's being aware, actually being here. There's a very good reason for this. If you want to have a conversation with someone, if you want to understand something, how can we do that if we're not present? Right? It's very obvious. But, you know, how many disagreements, how many arguments, how many misunderstandings do we, do we have simply because someone's not listening, because we're not paying attention, right? So this is, the, this is the first and most primary prerequisite for having a meaningful conversation, is we need to actually be present. We have to be here first if we want to understand something. And not just intellectually, not like, yeah, 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 I'm here, I'm listening. No, 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 really be here, yeah? We can feel it when someone's listening to us, right? You know when someone's really showing up. And you know when someone's not. They can be looking you right in the eye, yeah? But if their mind is somewhere else, it's got that like slightly glazed over look, or there's, uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, 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 uh-huh, you're like, hello, where are you, right? Let alone if someone pulls out their phone, <laughs> right? That happens, right? We're in the middle of a conversation. I, I've, I do it myself. 
You know, like I, the mind is just, it's not just the mind, it's how we are being conditioned. And this is one of the primary challenges to this, to this first training of presence, of being more aware, is that there are tremendous forces in our society and culture today doing everything they can to keep us glued to a screen. Billions of dollars going into persuasive design, persuasive technology, and marketing to keep us addicted. So we're living at a time when there is a profound sense of disembodiment. Everything is, is out there in the virtual world, in the touch screen, in the future, down the line. Right? To have a conversation, we need to be in our body. Words are formed with breath. Conversation is organic. So we have to actually be here to have a conversation. Our society is also plagued by an addiction to instant gratification. So our whole nervous systems are becoming attuned to the pace and the rhythm of our devices. Remember dial-up? <laughs> right, DSL? How long it took for a page to load? Now if it's like more than half a second, we're like, come on, come on. Like, why won't it load? So what, what happens when we're expecting everything to be just push button, next, next, yeah, okay, okay, when you get into a conversation with somebody? The human beings don't work that way. Have you noticed? <laughs> Right? We're in a conversation, we're like, get to the point, get to the point. What do you want from me? What do you want from me? You know? Conversation, it goes this way, it goes that way. We're not sure what we're saying. It takes time. Right? We're talking about this, and then they bring up something else, and now there are two things on the table. It's messy. When was the last time you were in the forest? Are there any straight lines? No straight lines. It's chaos. There are trees on the ground, there are leaves, there are stones. There's no order. That's life. That's what this is. Language is part of life. It's messy. And we have to be here to be in the flow of that. The last uh, factor that's working against us in terms of being able to bring more awareness and presence to our conversations, again, which is to a large degree due to our devices and technology, is this, this um, pervasive fragmentation of our attention. Our minds, our, our attention is pulled in so many different directions from minute to minute every day. You know, you just walk out on the street and it's like, you know, signs and people and cars. And so it's no wonder that we get into a conversation and the attention span to actually stay engaged is going down, <laughs> is going down. So this is one of the reasons why contemplative training meditation practice is such an asset for communication training. For because of that, that first part of gathering and collecting our attention, we're going against all of these cultural and societal forces of disembodiment, instant gratification, fragmentation, and learning how to actually be here in a steady and stable way. And this is the foundation for being able to have a productive conversation. Not to mention, there's a host of other benefits for being more aware. We're less reactive, we have more choice, we pick up on more information about what's going on for ourselves and the other person. So the, uh, the training here is to learn how to lead with presence. Let the first thing you do in a conversation be to show up before what you're gonna say, what you want to accomplish, your agenda, what happened, your emotions or feelings, just show up. Get on the map. Make sure that you're actually seeing the other person in front of you. 
rather than a story in your mind about who they are based on the past, based on your judgments or prejudice. Really relate. So two ways to do this. There, there, I, I list many tools for this and uh, practices. There's guided meditations that come with the book. But two things that you can start working with today. First, see if you can feel your body. Just that. Can you be aware of the weight of your body? Can you feel your hands? Can you take a breath? Being aware of our body is a great way to be more aware and present. The mind can move a, a thousand miles an hour. If you're aware of a sensation in that moment, you're present. Because sensations don't exist in the past or the future. So if you're in a heated conversation with someone, you're feeling overwhelmed or stressed, you don't know what to do, come back to your body. That's your ground of awareness. That gives you an internal base from which to meet what's happening, okay? This is one tool you can start to play with. Second, pause. You can pick up one of these if you want to remember it. Put it on your desk. Put it on your, put it on your computer. Very important for email practice. Before you send the email, pause. Just take a moment. Is this actually going to be helpful? Do I want to say this? doesn't need to be a long pause, particularly in New York. If you pause for too long, forget it. I mean, I, I come from a Jewish family, so we, you know, we talk over each other, we interrupt each other. There's no pauses. Um, but, uh, so they've got to be short. It's called a micro-pause. <laughs> it's like half a breath. But it's just enough time. It's just enough time to have some choice instead of reacting habitually or automatically. We take that half a breath, that, that micro-pause, and there's a little bit of space to actually steer and navigate in the conversation, right? So you're having a political debate with somebody, a coworker, a family member, you're on opposite sides, they say something that just inflames you because of a whole variety of reasons and you're about to lash out or, you know, pause. <sighs> All right, let me see if I can understand where you're coming from. Different approach. That pause gives us the space to use any of the other tools that we have. If we don't pause, if we're not aware, we're just, we're just on automatic. And then we don't have access to our wisdom, to our, to our best intentions, or to any of the tools that we've learned. As I'll tell you a short story about uh, awareness, bringing more presence to conversation, then I'll move on to some of the other trainings. I was teaching a retreat uh, this summer in the Southwest. So one of the things that I do, in addition to teaching meditation retreats, is I teach communication retreats, where we go back and forth between meditating in silence and then doing relational practice. How do we bridge that gap? So about uh, 30 of us spend a week together doing this. Uh, and then at the end, there's a go-round. Everyone shares, you know, 30 seconds, a minute. What are you taking away? How was it for you? Uh, so there's this one, this one gentleman who didn't, didn't speak much the whole week. Um, older, older guy, white guy from Colorado in his 70s, kind of cowboy type. Uh, so, you know, we're sitting there talking about opening the heart and loving kindness and being patient. And so, you know, I've got my stereotypes and, uh, you know, I'm aware of them, but so I'm curious, like, hey, what's, this, what's this person taking away from this retreat? I'm really curious about what he's going to say. So the microphone comes around to him, and uh, he, he, takes a, he takes a long pause, and he says, what I'm taking away from this week, what I learned this week is that my wife is the person I talk to the most but talk with the least. Now, I'm going to change that when I go home. So this is the power of bringing more awareness, more presence 
to our conversations. We recognize there's another human being there. Am I really relating to them in this moment? That's the foundation. So once we're here, now, now we're actually playing the game. We're, we're, we're on the map. The next training is checking to see if the map is oriented properly, <laughs> okay? Which direction are we pointed and are we going in the direction that we wanna go? This is about our intention. What's our intention in the conversation? And are we on automatic? Are we coming from default habitual cultural conditioning that's not actually going to bring about the results we want? Particularly when there's a conflict, when there's a difference. What's our habit? Where are we coming from? When you have a disagreement with somebody, what's, what's your default response in terms of your intention? What are you trying to do? Come on, be honest. Right. right, we want to be right. What else? We want to defend ourselves. We want to get our way. We want to win. Right, we might attack them. We might blame them. Yeah. We might want to sell something. <laughs> we might want to sell something. Right, we're trying to convince them or, or sort of control or manipulate the situation to have a certain outcome. So how's that been working out for you, <laughs> right? Yeah. Get this, so even when we win, even when we get our way, right, there's a bill to pay. It comes at a cost, right? So these intentions, these habitual intentions of wanting to be right or win or convince the other person, they work to a certain degree or we wouldn't use them. They can produce results but they come at a cost. So one of the most powerful and transformative ingredients in a dialogue is the intention to understand. This changes the whole atmosphere of the conversation. Why? Because fundamentally, on some level, any communication is about sending and receiving a message, right? Even if, even, if I'm a, even if I'm asking you to pass me the salt, I want you to understand what I'm saying. So what more useful intention to have in a conversation than the intention to understand, if that's what communication's about? But a lot of the times we miss this most fundamental element. Lots of times conversations go like this. I say something. You don't really listen. You just respond and say something else. I don't listen to you either. I just respond and say something else to that. And neither of us are listening to, the, to each other. It's, it's like being on the phone and the call dropped, but we're both still talking. <laughs> and neither of us are aware that the call dropped. Right? So this intention to understand is about actually checking to see, am I hearing you? Am I hearing you right? Is this what you're saying? I want to make sure I'm getting it. Rather than just assuming I've understood and then reacting to the story I'm telling about you. I want to check it out and say, okay, well, this is the story I'm telling about what you just said. Is this right? Have I got it? If, I've, if, if I did get it, okay. Now, now, now we're actually hearing each other. Okay? Another very important reason why intention is so important in conversation. <laughs> You're having a conversation with somebody and they're saying one thing with their words, their tone of voice, their body language, those micro expressions that we barely pick up on consciously but which register on some level are telling you something else. Which do you believe, the words or everything else that you're picking up on? Right, we, we believe the body, right? We trust all that nonverbal communication. So linguists say something like 70 or 80% of our communication is nonverbal. What do you think's creating and shaping 
all of that nonverbal communication, it's our intention. It's where we're coming from inside that's painting that whole picture. Which is why if someone's trying to pull one over on you, if we're paying attention, we feel it, we pick up on it, we feel that intention. Whereas if someone is actually listening and interested, we feel that too. So this too can change the whole trajectory of a conversation. So the training here, so if the first training is to lead with presence, the second training is to learn how to come from curiosity and care. How can I be genuine in my intention to understand this person, especially if I disagree with them, especially if they see things differently from, from me? It's very rare to use conflict as an opportunity to connect, to actually try to hear one another. But when we can do that, we're cultivating one of the most important skills we can cultivate in life. We're learning how to make peace. And if there's one thing this world needs, it's more people who know how to do that, right? More people who know how to respond to someone who's upset, who's angry, who's disagreeing, who's belligerent, and learn how to connect how to transform that situation. That's what we're studying here. So to come from curiosity and care. The, the care piece, it's always important to, to, um, to clarify what I mean by care, particularly when I'm not in California.